So uh, the next speaker, uh, Anne Jan, so I had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of days earlier. And I thought, oh, he must be a fascinating uh, person, because else how does he get there? Then he introduced himself and the topic as uh, someone who wor works for the government as a civil servant. So, <laughs> you know, that was rocking my world. So then, you know, then I woke up and... Uh, and I've understood that his story is actually pretty amazing, so I got wildly excited about it and I promised him to pay attention because I nodded off halfway through. But that's my problem, not uh, on the on. Have a great time. Thank you. Um, to do an introduction, um, I'm Anneon Brouwer. I have been a developer for 20 years now. I uh, started programming age six when my father got me a Commodore 64. And those tapes were pretty expensive, so I went to the library, got some books, started typing over, fixing bugs in the books with pencil. And uh, nowadays I work for a company called No Protocol and have been uh, working for the min Ministry of Health for the last two years. I'm also doing some hobby projects, badge team, electronic event badges, uh, QT Pass, a frontend for a password manager, and I'm an angry nerd at the Angry Nerds podcast. So, February 2020, the Netherlands is in trouble. Corona is here. And what do we do? Well, the Ministry of Health decided to do a epithon, a big new good idea. Let's do a hackathon. Let's make an app to solve this crisis. Hilarity ensued. There were uh, two days live broadcasted. 20 companies, all with their wild ideas that could never work. Um, but there was one good thing going there, because uh, the director of uh, information management at the Minist <laughs> Ministry of Health, Ron Rosendahl, decided, yeah, this is not going to work. Everybody's complaining. Well, if you're complaining, yeah, uh, if you're complaining and you know it all so well, why don't you prove it? So he gave a call to Brenno de Winter, a pretty well-known Dutch um, IT journalist in the past, nowadays consultant, and he told him, well, if you know so well, prove it. And Brenno said, yeah, okay, but then we need people we can trust, people that have done public uh, pro approvable work, for example, people who organize hacker camps people that you've worked with late nights, dragging cables over the field and have them on the stage next day presenting some awesome idea. So, Breno looks around and gets in touch with the next guy, a dear friend of mine for 25 years now, Mendel Mobach, and he does weird things with computers. He's a crypto architect and he got hired. He's also a podcast friend. And he was like, yeah, let's do this well. Um, as you can see, we have done this in the past together, so hence the slides look similar. Um, and Breno calls Mendel, yeah, we're gonna do the Corona Check app, uh, the Corona Melder app. It's gonna just be a couple of weeks, very simple app, but it has to be privacy first, secure by design, and everybody should be able to use it. So, very little um, coupling with devices. Luckily, Google and Apple decided on a standard that's been used in all of Europe for notifications. So, when you get corona, you get tested by the um, municipal healthcare, and you can choose to share that data with the app, and it gets broadcast, and people that were near you get notified um, of, of the case, but it's completely private because it's all just random numbers that are collected and there's very, uh, it's impossible to connect it to you as a person. So, November, everybody's working hard and all of a sudden, whoo, vaccinations. That's fun, we're gonna start doing vaccinations in four weeks and everything is ready for that, right? We have software in place that can be used to register those vaccinations. Everything is there, right? Well, no. 
all the software was either very outdated, ancient, couldn't be used because of gaping security holes that yeah, would take ages to fix, completely impossible. Uh, so what do we have? Well, we have Excel. People who, can just, who set the vaccinations can just type in the social security number, name, which vaccine, what date, and email it to the, the central registry. That will work, right? Well, yeah. If you've ever seen a doctor's handwriting, mostly the typing is just as bad. So, Breno de Winter gives me a call. Um, he knows that I've done very uh, short-term projects uh, with high impact because normally I work for companies like KLM, MasterCard, and if they do anything with personal data, um, recording that in a, a campaign or whatever, and there's a data leak, well, that's going to be more expensive than the whole marketing budget for the next 10 years. So it has to be secure, auditable, etc. So I get a call. It's going to be a simple app. It needs to be secure. Just a couple of weeks of work. Can you do it? Also, it's under the radar because the municipality, uh, municipal healthcare system and the others are claiming that their plan A and B will be finished before that time. They can patch it, they can fix it, it's not that bad. Well, no. <laughs> so, 15th of December, my first day of work at the Ministry of Health. Uh, together with Mendel, we make a nice design. We break it into blocks, so we do the first bit of encryption in the web browser. So even the web server is kind of blind to what is posted, except for its encrypted data that fits the genre. We use PostgreSQL as our best NoSQL solution to store that data, um, send it over to the secure area. Well, no, not send it over. The secure area has to fetch it. And uh, there we can have some views, and those are secured. Well, very nice. We do this design, so in the afternoon, first commits, and in the evening, first design review. So the first thing I actually did, and that's nice to be after the guy from Software Improvement Group, CI all the things. The first commit was actually a linter for the readme.markdown, just a markdown linter, because you can check everything, and then also set the bar as high as you can. We were using Python, we take black and PyLint and set it all to the highest standards. We use a bit of PHP. We take P, um, what's that thing called? Uh, PHP Stan, set it to level seven of seven. Everything gets linted, everything gets checked, and then you do, where possible, some test-driven development. We've got a design, we have interfaces defined, so why not? So, next day. Uh, because we were under the radar, we had to give it a name, and Breno de Winter has a couple of cats. One of them is called Brani, and Brani's nickname was Brani Banani. So we called the first bit of the application Brani. Um, I think it's also in here? No. Yes, it is. Uh, so first thing, Brani, then Banani, Keiko, Zeiko, because his other cat meows a lot, called Keiko, so we called it Keiko de Zeiko. Since we're under the radar, I go to the supermarket, take a picture of the banana uh, part of the shop, and make a nice website. Soon op opening here, Brani Banani for all your uh, banana needs. Why not? Since we have very little time, only three weeks, uh, we have to do this stuff in public. We can't just set up um, environments for people to test because there's going to be new people coming every day, every hour. So luckily, the second day, I also get some help. Developers, really nice. So they start looking at the code, do a little change, and bling, the CI is pretty tough. So yeah, go back to your pull request, change a bit, because the linting is not what you're used to, or the coding standards. And well, let's continue. Next day, my birthday. Awesome. Uh, did a lot of work and did some remote dining with my family. And yes, I said, I got a birthday gift, developers. So this brings me to a problem. I call a friend and say, this is my first time that I have to manage a team, a team of people. I mean, I've been working with like three, four 
uh, as a team, but not me as the team lead. So what do we, what do, we do? And we come up with, yeah, just simple everyday stand-up. And well, since you're working weekends and holidays, let's do the stand-up a bit later. I'm not a morning person, so <laughs> let's do that. And other than that, yeah, just have the team decide what's best. So we go and I start onboarding those people. And the first thing I tell them, this is a very high velocity project. If at any point in any layer of this stuff, even in management or whatever, if you see a problem, you might be the only one seeing it. So make a note, um, make a issue, either if it's an interpersonal thing, give me a phone call, or if you don't trust me, give someone else, for example, Breno a phone call. But if you see something, say something, because otherwise it can't work. And yeah, as I said, those PRs, uh, I've set up very strict linting, everything, so the first commit always breaks for a new developer. And that uh, is a nice opportunity for them to set up their RDE or whatever they use to have the linting analysis, all that stuff in there. So the next time they commit, they know it will pass through the CI. So now we have another problem. We are starting to get an application done, nice segmented in small bits, but we need hosting and it's almost Christmas. Who's going to be hosting this? We need uh, three data centers, so, um, geologically, uh, geologically spaced, something like that. Um, how do we do that? Well, we find three providers, we do some assessment, one of them directly is out of the window, and there's one that is pretty hands-on, uh, pro-location, and they have been in our Jitsi ever since, uh, just hanging out, doing all the server needs we did have. Then we have another op problem. Um, who here knows what an HSM is? Less than half. Uh, HSM stands for Hardware Security Module, so it's kind of like a labor camp for keys. They get born there, they die there, and they do their work. They can't ever get out. <laughs> a labor camp for keys. Um, since we are uh, handling medical data, we need some hardware way of securing those keys. And if you've ever tried to buy an HSM, that stuff takes weeks. It has to burn in to feel safe, etc. So we don't have that time. What other option is there? Well, on my keychain, I have an HSM. You might as well, a YubiKey. These are actually HSMs. Keys can be created on them. They can do work with those keys, encryption, decryption, signing, and the keys can never come off. So what do we do? We do a key ceremony. We have a notary, we provision the servers with, a, we provision a laptop with a blank image, we provision the keys, we put them in the server, put a nice uh, temper evidence seal on it, and go. So yeah, the good thing is they're very cheap, available, works with standard libraries. So when we got the actual HSM, we could just drop in replace, actually. That worked really well. So, work day 10. We uh, work some more on the back end. We finally get some DBAs in. And because of reasons, uh, the DBA team is completely separate from the sysadmin team. And our DBAs are uh, redundantly provisioned. They're two brothers. From, <laughs> from Nibble IT, so that works very well. And since we got our sysadmin in, he also could make a nice view. Again, we have the Harry 3, Harry 4, Harry 5. Uh, we just started counting our projects and Harry, it was, had to be quickly done, so we called it Harrye. Even snel in elkaar Harrye. So we uh, started with Harry 3. There is no 2 and 1, then came Hari 0, which is the Docker uh, setup for um, developers, so they can quickly develop. Uh, New Year's, and our director of information says, yeah, go reacquaint with your family or something, just stop working. Well, most of us did, not all. So the next day is a holiday, so stand-up is at 1300. And good thing, 
we have our machines running over Christmas and New Year's, actually ProLocation delivered those servers, our sysadmin team rolled everything out with Ansible, and we had a nice long weekend, no distractions from other people working at the Ministry of Health, no other IDs from other people, so we could get some work done. Everybody's working hard and we have to go live in three days. The main idea of this application is to send data, vaccination data, to the National Institute for Public Health and the Environment, RIVM, um, so they can do their statistics and later on we can use it for Corona check, but we'll get to that later. So, standards. The National Institute for Public Health and the Environment made a standard DPV-161, which changed five times in three days because it was a terrible standard. We got some data models from them that was very good for my personal hygiene because every time I would look at those data models, I had to take a shower. It was <laughs> terrible. <laughs> so, we have to go live. And everybody thinks, yeah, we have to do this. Um, uh, what is it called? Uh, test, uh, testing, acceptance, production, uh, development, testing? No, no. In reality, nobody does that. Everybody does development, production, testing, acceptance. Acceptance always comes last, just like the stages of grief. <laughs> when you're in a hurry, you just need to get that stuff working on production and we can get the, the acceptance environment after that. But how do we get the credentials to all those people that are going to be doing the vaccinations? Because the first vaccinations were not done by the municipal health services. No, they were done by Arbo Arts, uh, doctors at uh, old people's homes, those kind of people. Well, we get some military cooperation. They were very, very willing to go to people's houses, ring the bell, ask for their ID and present them with their credentials. And then we have to go live. 6th of January, 7 in the morning, truncate all the registrations from the databases and yes, first person vaccinated via our system, registered, we got the data, data is sent to the, uh, to the National Institute for Health and we're happy. So how did we do this? How did we get this stuff through auditing? Because it was audited by two external agencies and everything. By a first step, having good architecture. Second, always have four eyes on the code. Pull requests have to be signed off by a code owner that looks at all the changes and nobody can make a stupid mistake. They still happen. But then at least two people made that mistake. One in coding it, the other in reviewing it. Uh, set your coding standards to the highest levels and automate that in CI. So, levels of CI. Syntax and coding standards, code flow data types, so static analysis, dependency availability and vulnerabilities. There's a lot of stuff for that. For example, Dependa, Bot, Sneak, many more. Um, then, does the code actually work? So, in the CI, just either build it, run it, and do some unit feature end-to-end -end testing, for example, with robot framework. What should you CI? All the things. If you can lint it, analyze it, build it, run it, test it, CI it, because you have to do that. Um, then continuous delivery. I would have loved to do it in the way I normally do. Everything has code, so you merge to a release, you tag a release, and it gets rolled out to production. Here, that wasn't possible. We had to use 4i's principle. And luckily, our sysadmins put everything in Ansible, so it was very easy to just have a tagged release that creates a zip file with either uh, compiled code or ready to deploy code. And on the Ansible machine, you just say, update, <laughs> runs, done. Um, but we also have a separate DBA team. So, rolling out stuff to production turned out to be a three, four person thing and then do some last testing in production to see if there's no terrible regression. In the meanwhile, um, people decided that they wanted more freedom, less lockdowns 
and one of the ways that was uh, decided in Europe was to have a QR code that shows that you're either vaccinated, tested, or recovered. So after a positive test, some days have passed. And that European QR code is full of data. It has everything. It has all your vaccinations, the date, the batch number, everything. It has your full name, your uh, full date of birth. In the Netherlands, we didn't want that. We wanted privacy by design, less data is better. So all that the Dutch QR codes have is your initials and the date of birth without the year. Because who needs to know how old you are? You just have to check your date of birth. Um, also, the Dutch QR codes change every one and a half minutes. So even if you're like McDonald's and someone goes to every McDonald's, you, we can't see that, they can't see that, because the code actually changes every one and a half minutes. Um, those QR codes, they should work for everybody. Not everybody has a smartphone. So there should also be a printable version. Simple website, have them printed. Some people don't have computers. So there has to be a way for them to be sent. Um, we made a system where you just enter your uh, social security number and your uh, postal code of your house address, just the numbers. It looks it up in the basic registration of persons. If that matches, then it, we continue and you get your printed out stuff sent home. Well, who is good at sending uh, posts in the Netherlands? We were going to go for the CAIB, Central Justicial Incasso Bureau. It was a bit controversial, but the second best option was the Belasting Dienst. They have a very nice print, uh, um, printing setup that they just download the PDFs and it gets automatically sent, um, addressed, put in the envelopes, everything works. So, still not everybody can get that stuff. Not everybody's vaccinated with the municipal health care uh, system. Those people we already made a system for, but then there's also people that got vaccinated very early. Um, flight attendants got vaccinated somewhere in a non-European country. How do they get their QR codes? So we have to make some software for that. No willing person left behind <coughs> to make some true equality. Um, the only problem with that is it's so easy to make those custom QR codes. So it started happening that the exceptions were becoming the rule, which is not very good for security, for health, for safety, for anything. So we had to prevent that. That was mostly done by getting, um, using different ways of uh, signing in. in um, most doctors in the Netherlands have a so-called UziPass, Unique Zorg Identifier Pass. It's a two-factor card via USB, uses some middleware to work with Firefox and they can automatically log in. We can see, ah, he's a doctor, accredited. So we don't have to send out credentials. And the good thing about the law is that if they abuse this, there are ways to handle that. So we go live, it was pretty interesting. I'm not a big fan of Hugo de Jonge in any way, but I thought it was pretty cool that at uh, 12 at night, from the back of his uh, car, he was in our uh, Yitzi group doing the live because they said, yeah, you can co all call on WebEx. And we said, nope, if he wants to be there, he has to go to our place, our Yitzi. So then there wasn't a lot of political discussion in the Netherlands, the 5G, 3G, 2G. So the Gs were taken from German, geimpft, getested, genesen? I don't know, something like that. <laughs> and since we were doing all this development and there was all these contro controversies in the politics, what could we do? I mean, we didn't know before the press conference which way it was going to go. Sometimes we knew an hour in advance, but most of the time not. So you just put in all the options and then do the press conference driven development, just sit there. <laughs> So, what, where are they going? Okay, no shaking hands. Yeah, we've seen all that stuff before. 
ah, no, there's not going to be 2G. Good, then we just make the new configuration, sign it, push it, and the app now does 3G. Hooray. Um, since we're working for the government, and there's a new law, the Wet Open Overheid, and we looked into that stuff a bit more, actually the Dutch law now says public money is public code. So we've published most of our stuff on GitHub under the EUPL 1.2 license, and we are really pushing for other government parts to do the same. More code reuse, saves a lot of money, saves a lot of time, makes everybody a lot more happy. And about that code reuse, if you have a vaccination registration program, who's going to use that? Well, possibly in the next pandemic or whatever. But if you take that application and take all the smaller bits and make it separate um, repositories, make it into Lego blocks, Duplo blocks, then that works a lot better, way nicer for reuse. So, are there any questions? Not yet. <laughs> no questions. That's boring. Then I might have to do some of my example questions. <laughs> so let's start with the vla and pop. <laughs> um, Brani Badani was a very nice name to start with, but you can't just put that in front of a minister and put that on his desk. Yeah, this is going to be the new application to save our country. It's called Brani Banani. <laughs> Might not go over so well, so what we decided to do, BRBA. Why not? <laughs> just make an abbreviation. So we had a whole lot of abbreviations. Uh, ZKVI, hospitals can enter information. <laughs> All those kind of things. And then, yeah, we have all these three uh, four-letter acronyms. Let's call that VLA, vier letter afkortingen. <laughs> and some people in the Netherlands don't have DigiID. They don't, they don't even have a social security number, but they do get vaccinated by the municipal healthcare system. Um, for example, Ukrainian refugees. And how do they get their data? Well, with PAP, the patient ID authentication provider. And is that a VLA? No, but it's a liquid dessert. <laughs> so, how come we didn't use any managed services from a cloud provider? Um, because we didn't need to, and because we had someone who was very vocal against cloud, not me. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was not my, uh, my, my ditch to die on to get it in the cloud. Um, we just did it pretty old school. Uh, how did you deal with updating QR codes in printable form? Uh, we did not. They just have an expiration date of three months. And then you have to get a new one. So, unfortunately, the printed version is less uh, privacy friendly than the app. Well, in that case, I would like to thank you. I know you wouldn't disappoint. That was awesome. Thank you. Very, very much. <laughs> Press conference driven development. That's a new one. Yeah. So, uh, thank you for that. You're welcome. That's going to stick with me for a while.